Um, thank you very much. Happy International Women's Day. And it's really incredible to see a lot of you who I've been meaning to meet. And I see somebody right there who I'm meant to do a podcast with, but I seem to be really busy. So I'm going to speak to you afterwards. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, I, I promise, I promise, I promise. It's, um, it's really interesting sitting here um, thinking, like, you know, 12 years ago, I stood in Trafalgar Square and I said, my name's Dimko Ali and I'm a survivor of FGM. And at the time, when I first also told my story within the Evening Standard, I remember, I think a lot of you might see my um, name either spelled with a C or spelled with a K. When I first came out into activism, I knew that there would be um, um, backlash in, in, in terms of me talking about my own anatomy and the experience of female genital mutilation. But I never really understood what the backlash would be and how I would be victim blamed by those people that I expected to protect me. At the age of seven, I was subjected to FGM in Djibouti. Um, I'm from the Somali community and 98% of Somali women have undergone FGM. But I'm one of the only people who's lived in this country previous to FGM and after FGM. I remember coming back into my school and trying to just get some kind of context. So I said to my teacher, I said, I had this really weird thing happen to me. And I was very like, you know, graphic about the experience. And she looked at me, she says, well, that's fine. That's what just happens to girls like you. I had no idea what girls like me meant. But at that same time as well, I also had no idea that those that were meant to protect me also saw me through the lens of a cultural, um, through, a, through, a, through a cultural lens. I grew up, I had a really invasive form of FGM. Um, and I ended up getting medical intervention at the age of 11. Again, I would have thought like, you know, here I am now, I don't need to explain my damage to you and the abuse that I was suffered, um, I suffered, but you can see it again, nobody did anything. So I just went along and thought, you know what, this has nothing to do with me. And I remember it was 2016 and I was in Bristol and I was talking to a cohort of young Somali girls, all 13, British born, well, EU born. And I realized that as the conversation went on, that 13 out of the 14 girls had been subjected to FGM. But still, um, no one was interested. I came to London and I still felt that my silence was massively complicit to the misunderstanding of what FGM was. Something at the time which was called a cultural um, violence, something that happened within community, something that happened out of ignorance. But I knew it was an organized crime against gender. <coughs> I remember when I first did this interview with the Evening Standard, I said, I really don't want my name to be out there. But they said, but we have to tell the story. We have to put a, pay, um, a picture, a face to the story. And I said, that's fine. I'll, but I said, but don't spell my name with a C because I have a job to so spell it with a K because I thought I was Superman. I was going to hide behind those <laughs> Clark Kent glasses. Um, and I put a hat on and I thought, you know what, it's going to be fine because it's the Evening Standard and nobody that I know is going to read it. And it's just going to be picked up by um, several people on the tube and they're going to really understand that FGM is something that is wrong. Um, and the first thing that happened was that I walked into my house and my brother um, looked at me and he said, is it true? And I said, yes, it's true. It's fine. And he said, is mum going to get arrested? So we had this conversation and I thought that was fine. I said, so my brother's OK with it. And then I got a call from my brother three days later, and he said, where, where are you? And I said, why? He said, well, where are you? I said, I'm at home. And he said, well, you need to come home because I'm worried about you. And I was like, why are you worried about me? And um, somebody had reached out to him and said that I dishonored the community and dishonored the family, and I should be dead. And I thought, it's the, it's the 2000s, it's London, that really can't be serious. And I, and I knew within my family that that wasn't a thing to do. But for me, it wasn't the fact that a man within my community thought that I was disrespectful to my community and there was some kind of honor in killing me. It was the fact that when I told the authorities, when I went to go seek help, it was about me being too open, too Western, maybe not speaking about FGM the way that I did. And, this was, and these were white progressive people telling me this. And I thought to myself, do you know what? I have a voice. I'm someone that is well known. And if these are the conversations that are being had with me, well, what are the conversations that are being had with, 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 with other women within the community who are unable to speak up? So it was from that instance when I thought we need to be able to change the language around FGM. I'm not a victim. I'm a survivor of FGM. There are 200 million women living with the consequences of FGM. And FGM is not a cultural issue. It's not something that happens through ignorance. It's a form of violence against women and girls. It's a form of child abuse. And in a country which kind of, like, you know, prouds itself in terms of this kind of Western um, nobility, the idea that I had to explain that the experience of young black girls being subjected to FGM was abuse was quite horrific. I, would spe I spent at least the, f the first six to seven years of my um, activism trying to get people to care about young black girls and trying to understand that FGM was a form of violence against women and girls. And I did it at that time, 
But now when somebody tells me, why should we care about FGM? I just ask you, why should we care about young black girls? It's not about why should we care about FGM. We should care about FGM just the way we should care about domestic violence, we should care about rape, and we should care about all these, um, all these things. Um, ultimately, we were successful in terms of um, trying to um, get the legislation passed in, um, with FGM. But those same conversations that I had in 2006, um, 2006, 2010, and 2012 came up again in, 28, um, in 2019. We wanted to add FGM to the, to the Children's Act in order for children for it to be easier for children to be protected. If a girl is born and is at risk of FGM, there has, she has to ultimately be so at risk of FGM that then the protection order is put in. But if the mother has had FGM, then the risk factors are there and within the Children's Act that we can, um, we can have um, protection. And this was fine. I thought, like, you know, it's the same. We, 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 we do this with religious families that don't want to um, give um, medical intervention to their children. And then I remember I got a call from the Conservative whip at the time. Okay, I know, do you know what? I know Julie's looking at me. I'm going to be very positive about certain people, but it's within the context of this kind of conversation. I got a, um, I got a call from the Conservative whip, and he said... Um, the private members bill is going through, um, it's really supported through the house, but um, Christopher Chopes <laughs> is gonna object. Um, would you mind having a conversation with him? And here I was, I thought, I was subjected to FGM at the age of seven. I almost died at 11. I've spent 11 years trying to fight to have girls protected. And now a leader of a political party who is meant to be able to keep his MPs in line is calling me a survivor to speak to a man who is who shouldn't actually be in parliament anyway <laughs> but and if you know me i'm not known for being polite or nice but i sucked it up i um, called him and i called him i called him twice and he ignored me and then i sent him a lovely text message which i started with sir christopher because apparently he was knighted um and i put out to the whole point i said listen um the fact that i know that you're kind of um, saying that this piece of legislation hasn't gone through scrutiny, it has gone through the committees, it's not just going to go and kind of go through Parliament, it's going to go through the sex stage, it's going to be, it's like, you know, all the issues that you have, I'm happy to meet you face to face and have conversations with you. And then he replied back to me and he said, no, no, I'm really concerned about the fact that we're going to be um, stigmatising um, communities and this might be um, a racially sensitive um, piece of legislation. Um, to be fair, I don't think um, Christopher Chopes cares about racism. Um, <laughs> but it was a thing that he used, and he was being supported by um, people within my own community who really want, who really want things like FGM to kind of um, come through. So obviously, in, um, he turned up, he objected. And I can't tell you that I haven't cried like that since the last time I think I, I cried on that day was the time when somebody said that they were going to kill me for even talking about my experience of FGM. And I thought, but you know what, I'm not going to let this get, get me down. And thankfully, we had enough people um, within the government to be able to support and put the FGM um, legislation through the Children's Act, through, um, um, through the Prime Minister's office. I say that in the sense that I still, we still live in a community, we still live in a country where the rights of young black and ethnic minority girls are marginalized. There are, st there are still things that are happening to young black and ethnic minority girls that are seen as other. And that comes back to one of the reasons why I resigned from the Home Office recently. Not only am I a survivor of FGM, but I'm also um, a refugee. I came to this country at the age of seven as a refugee. I think I've contributed a lot to this country. I do believe that the immigration system has to exist. I'm not one that is standing here and saying the fact that we need to have open borders and we don't need to have any checks um, in, t in terms of immigration. But I am saying that we are a country that are able to treat their refugees and those people that are seeking asylum with humanity and to be able to be just to them. <laughs> one of... One of the fundamental things that really irritated me and really disgusted me, which I missed yesterday because it was International Women's Day and I was busy, is the fact that the, um, the Foreign Office launched its women and girls strategy, saying that they were going to put women and girls at the heart of our foreign policy. And our foreign policy is meant to project and amplify what, what, what we as a society believe. So if our Foreign Office is about women and girls, and if this is what our democracy and what Global Britain stands for, how is it that women and girls that come to this country who are trafficked, who have no choice in the way they came in, ultimately making it illegal, are now being considered as criminals? Thank you.
we we have um, a prime minister who says he cares about women and girls, but a prime minister who also literally yesterday, and I woke up to the, the, this morning, tweeting the fact that if you use bogus claims of trafficking, if you try to use bogus claims of human rights, if you do this, then you will be denied access to the protection that we have at the moment. Um, the, the, the previous Home Secretary and I, whatever you want to say about the Rwanda policy and everything like that, there was one thing that we fundamentally agreed with, the fact that women that are trafficked, that issues around trafficking are safeguarding issues, they're not issues of immigration. This immigration bill hasn't gone through and we as women in this room have to be able to have the conversation and say, not in our name, and not in our country, are we actually going to criminalise women who are victims? And I think that's one of the fundamental things that we need to kind of come together today. That's why I came through um, in terms of the issue of the conversation, because I know that there are, like, you know, um, Nigerian women that are being trafficked into this country. There are Ukrainian women. There are Afghan women. There are thousands of women who are in this country who are, who, who are enslaved today and who are as scared of our government as they are as scared of those people who are enslaving them. And I think we should be embarrassed on International Women's Day that our government tweeted out the rhetoric that I did yesterday and that is something that I'm making a commitment to today the fact that I will make sure that women who are trafficked are protected within this country <laughs> outside of um Outside of that, um, I'm the CEO of the Five Foundation, which is the global partnership to end FGM and why um, sex-based rights matter. Within the um, COVID pandemic, we, um, FGM went up by 30% in um, African countries. Within um, a space of three weeks, we, um, we lost 3,000 um, girls in a, in, a, in a part of um, Kenya to FGM. Um, I would love to... Um, to have the kind of gender, um, I don't know what the hell they, the UN talks about, but the UN consistently talks about that gender is the main issue and we shouldn't be able to talk about sex. But sex matters, sex-based rights matter, FGM, is um, a crime against women. You can't um, transition your way around, um, 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 out of FGM. And these are one of the kind of conversations that we need to be consistently having. The Five Foundation um, is basically built on the fact that we stand together in order to be able to end FGM by 2030. And if you want to hear about the work that we do, please do join us on our website. But ultimately, one of the key things that I want to do is the fact that as the world gets more progressive, Actually, let's not get more ignorant. Um, I, was in, I was in Somaliland recently, and this is what I mean about the whole conversations around these kind of um, social norms about talk, talking about gender at, a, um, at an international community level. I was in Somaliland um, a few weeks ago, and I was talking to the Minister of Gender, and he said to me, and we started talking about GBV, so gender-based so, so gender violence, and he was very adamant that he wasn't going to call FGM or any of these things gender-based violence. And I said to him, why would you mean? And he said, because the UN have told me that there are 92 genders. <laughs> and that was true, but the whole point was the fact that, um, and he said, so what were you born as? And as I, was, I, was, I was born as a girl. So, so the reality is, as progressive as people want to be, as conversations that they want to have about gender and to be inclusive and all these other kind of things, we are actually leaving out marginalized women who've never been able to have a space and to be able to have the conversations to be able to protect themselves. So what I want to say is thank you for all the great work that you do. And there are thousands, if not millions of women who are counting on us in order to be able to protect sex-based rights. And I'm more of a person that um, answers questions better than I like to talk at you, but thank you very much. And I'll, I'll, answer, I'll answer any questions later.